Good afternoon. Welcome to the Legacy Project inaugural event. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the Legacy Project. Uh, the Legacy Project is a new initiative here at CCM uh, brought to you by the Department of Communication under the leadership of Professor John Soltis. So, uh, yes. yes. And the Legacy Project is where each semester uh, our focus will be to honor an important event, uh, an historical figure, perhaps even a social movement, or an academic theory. Uh, distinguished guests, such as the guests today, uh, will help to enlighten us by looking a little closer, maybe a little differently, uh, at our focus topic. Today we honor the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, this is a movement characterized by civil resistance, civil disobedience, civil unrest, and I'm sure a multitude of other oxymorons uh, that represent the struggle. And though the civil rights struggle was really, uh, it really began post-American Civil War, uh, we typically think of the modern civil rights movement and the struggle at, as that time that is post-World War II, uh, and certainly escalating in the 1950s with such historic milestones as Brown versus the Board of Education, the Montgomery bus boycott, the desegregation of Little Rock Central High School. But to a wider American consciousness, it was 50 years ago that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. spoke so eloquent, eloquently at the infamous March on Washington, leading to the eventual passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and even influencing civil rights movement that led to the end of apartheid in South Africa. We will speak, we will hear from four speakers today and following the four speakers we will enter into a panel discussion uh, and following the panel discussion we will take questions from the audience. So you might want to think about that, jot some notes down as you're uh, listening so you can ask a particular speaker. Teaneck resident Theodore Smiley Lacey has been deeply committed to the struggle for equality for all for decades. A native of Montgomery, Alabama, she grew up in the segregated South and encountered many forms of racism. She worked closely with the late Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. during the famed Montgomery bus boycott of 1955. In the summer of 1957, she joined her late husband, Dr. Archie Lacey, traveling throughout the counties of Alabama, uh, researching voter registration and injustice in the political system, uh, and uh, their research served as the legal basis for the greater wave of protest and litigation that sought to in, uh, enfranchise the black voters of Alabama. Ms. Lacey's community involvement continued after moving to Teaneck, where she played a major role in successfully integrating the public school system. Among other notable achievements, the, she, uh, she cited for her efforts in the uh, civil rights movement in the book Triumph in a White Suburb by Reginald Demerell. Please welcome Mrs. Theodore Smiley Lacey. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me with you today. I certainly feel at home. Having been a teacher for 42 years, it's always nice to be to see the young, bright minds before you. So thank you for your attention just for a few minutes, and I'll try to be brief. There is a West African fable that says, that describes a bird called the San Kofo bird that flies forward while looking backwards. And the fable says, always remember the past, for therein lies the future. If forgotten, we are destined to repeat it. We all have a story to tell. A story, my story, like your story, begins long before we are born. My story began thousands of miles away from these shores. Born from
from the struggle of the Middle Passage, born from laws that declared the capturing of slaves lawful and acceptable, born in the auctioning off of my great-grandmother, a slave in Bedford, Virginia, born of a grandfather who escaped the cotton field with the hope of becoming more than a sharecropper, and born of a father who in many ways was responsible for Dr. King coming to Montgomery, Alabama, and a mother whose childhood friend, and one I've known all of my life, Rosa Parks, who helped to shape my life. As was indicated, I was born in Montgomery, Alabama, the cradle of the Confederacy, the deep Bible Belt, the state in which in 1868 it attempted to succeed from the Union, where the governor then, Governor George Wallace, who stood in the University of Alabama and declared, segregation today, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. I was to grow up in a strictly enforced segregated society. Separation, as you know, in many instances is important and is needed, but when it is based only on the color of your skin, it is cruel and unjust. As an African American, I was to grow up in a system that denied me the opportunity to play in parks, to enter a zoo, to eat at a lunch counter, to sit in any vacant seat on a bus, to be equally educated, and certainly unable to get any job that I chose to pursue. You know the story of the Montgomery bus boycott, and I will not take the time to detail all of it for you, but I was very young at that time and was very active in the Montgomery bus boycott. What I want you to know today, when you read about that story, it was the coming together of people of all color, religion, and background that made the Montgomery bus boycott a success. Mrs. Rosa Parks, a very gentle, kind, and well-known member of the community, was not the first person to be arrested on the bus for sitting in the section that had been designated for colored people. You see, the colored sign could be moved any time the deputized bus driver chose to have it moved. Any time you got on the bus and the bus driver wanted you to give the seat up for someone who was white, you had to do that, even if it meant getting off of the bus. I can name more people than I have time to share with you today who were in the same situation with Mrs. Parks. She would want you to know that it was not her tired feet that day, but it was her tired soul, tired of the injustice, tired of being treated like a second set class citizen. I was to get to know Dr. King, who became the leader of the Montgomery bus boycott long before the world knew him. He came to be the pastor at the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, a church where my father was president of a board of trustees and in many ways was responsible for him coming to Montgomery. He was really kind of pushed into the leadership and as much as you have heard his strong and charismatic voice, he was not the one to enter the room and say, I am the leader, here I am. He was the one that was chosen because of his kind and soft and deliberate manner. He was new to the community and had not known Mrs. Parks as I had known Mrs. Parks from childhood. But because of his leadership, he was chosen to lead the bus boycott. You know the story that the boycott continued for over a year. It was not just staying off of the bus that was significant, but it was the cruel and abusive treatment, the drive-by-night shootings, the bombing of churches, 
the fear of walking in the streets. Staying off the bus was not just keeping the buses from running, but there was every attempt had to be made to get the people who needed to ride the bus transportation back and forth. I was a gopher, they called at the time, because I would drive people back and forth to their jobs. I would also type releases and newspaper releases and letters for Dr. King. I was speaking to a group of young people of elementary class one day, and the young, there was a young third grader who raised her hand and said, why did you have to type his letters? Why didn't he type his own? Well, you see, the time has passed uh, when young people, young women especially, were able to do a little more than just type. But it was my pleasure and honor to do that. Significant for me, however, is that Dr. King taught me the true meaning of nonviolence. I happened to have been in a meeting with him the night that his house was bombed. When word came and he was told that his house had been bombed, we were alarmed and attempted to get up to go see what had happened to his wife and young daughter who were home at the time. He cautioned us to sit down and he said, no matter what has happened to my family, the movement, the Montgomery bus boycott movement will continue and it will continue peacefully. When we arrived at his house, all of the furniture in the living room had been blown through the front window out into the yard. We were alarmed, but fortunately, his wife and daughter had moved to the back of the house and they were not harmed. He came back out on the yard to speak to the throng of people who were upset that his house, this peaceful warrior, was what house would be bombed. So the mayor and council people also arrived. Television cameras were there. Dr. King, after checking on his family, came back out and said, do not be alarmed. The movement will continue. My family is fine. And we will not retaliate. This movement is a peaceful, nonviolent movement. I guess. That was the first time that I really understood what nonviolence meant. That in the midst of facing harm to his family, he could still see the larger picture of wanting equality and justice for all. We both moved from Montgomery. Dr. King went back to Atlanta. I came to New York City, and the struggle continued. Though the signs were down, the signs, black only, were not seen. There were other signs, and we immediately became involved in wanting to see a change. The last time I saw Dr. King was here in New Jersey, and he teased us about having abandoned the South. I assured him that there was plenty to be done right here in New Jersey. And so the struggle continues. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Lacey. <laughs> Professor John Apwa holds a Bachelor of Arts and Master of Arts in French from Seton Hall University. He also earned a Master of Arts in English and Comparative Literature from Rutgers. Uh, originally from Ghana, uh, Professor Apwa is a distinguished associate professor in CCM's English and Philosophy Department. Uh, and today, Professor Apwa will speak to us about the role of the poet in dismantling apartheid. Professor Apwa. Well, my... Uh you can hear me, right? Yes. Okay. My uh, talk uh, this afternoon basically uh, is a segue to what uh, the program here is about. Although apartheid was not used uh, as commonly uh, as it was used in uh, South Africa, 
I'm uh, sure you all know that certain of his policies were uh, obviously in uh, effect, especially in the deep uh, south. Okay. So I just want to shed a little more light on some of the contributions that the uh, poets made in the process of uh, dismantling this uh, nefarious uh, policy of white South Africa. I begin by asking who killed apartheid. I said the economic sanctions with my vice and my clamp. I killed apartheid and everybody cheered. No, I did, shouted the ANC, African National Congress, the freedom fighters who were putting up a military uh, resistance. I did with my Kalashnikov and my Molotov cocktail, that is. I killed apartheid and all cheered and clapped again. Nay, it was I who slew apartheid, protested the poet with the point of my pen. And there was silence. Some even sniggled. Now, regarding the, de the demise of apartheid, some credit the economic sanctions imposed on the white South African government. Others, the military efforts of the African National Congress, which was founded in 1912. However, few, especially in the West, ever even considered the third front, the poets. So this severely abridged paper, says so severely average because it was about 25 pages to begin with, is meant to shed some light on the contributions of this unsung third front to the eventual dismantling of apartheid in South Africa. Now, much of black African uh, art is considered as functional, that is, it serves a, pur a purpose in the lives of the people. Black South African poetry is particularly engaged because of the unique political experience of the natives of South Africa, the Zulus, the Bantus, and the Hosas. The unique experience to which I allude is the colonial, specifically the system of apartheid. The policies of apartheid were comprehensive and calculated to marginalize, to humiliate, to, dis to degrade, and to disenfranchise and obviously violently repress, as well as erase the consciousness of self of the native South Africa. The poet's main goal was to confront this objectification of the natives by awakening the conscience of the world to the deplorable conditions under which the native South Africans were living, and also to awaken the, cells, the, self, the sense of self among the natives themselves. So having said that, I wish now to briefly attempt to trace the evolution of black South African poetry from its early phase, which I shall call the epical phase of the pre-colonial uh, era, through the elegiacal phase of the Sharpeville era. Sharpeville was a situation where a protesting group of uh, Africans were shut down randomly by uh, the white police officers, and culminating in the militant phase of the post-Soweto era. Soweto era refers to the student uprising, when the government imposed the Afrikaans language on the students. An example of the epical uh, poetry reflecting the pride and glory of the Zulu and the Bantu, traditional names of the South African tribes, is the following excerpt from a poem called Shaka, the King of Zulus. He is Shaka, the unshakable, thunderer while sitting, son of Menzi. He is the bird that preys on other birds, the battle axe that excels other battle axes. He is a long strided pursuer, son of Indaba, who pursued the moon and the sun. Another in the same vein is one by David Bereng called the 
the birth of Mosesh. That's his own father. Mosesh was a Soto general who, believe it or not, managed to beat the British forces on the battlefield with just spears. However, with the advent of apartheid and its consequent new dispensations, South African poetry began to shift from the epical to the liturgical, as illustrated in Benedict Velikazi's poem called In the Gold Mines. And I quote briefly for time. We yielded and came from our thatched huts and were herded here together like yoke oxen. Our family pride is gone. We are children, waking up at dawn, stood in a row. Herbert Lomos, Valley of the a Thousand Hills, also mourns the loss of Zulu and Bantu dignity. After Sharpville and before Soweto, that is 1976, the poetry appears to have moved from this uh, tone of elegiacal to a muted pro protest. A.C. Jordan's poem called Pass Office Song exemplifies the protest against the Zulu and the Bantu uh, and the alienization, not alienation, but alienization, making them foreigners in their own country under the relentless rule of apartheid. I quote, take off your hat. Where is your home name? What is your home name? Who is your father? Who is your chief? Where do you pay your tax? What river do you drink? We mourn for our country. Dennis Brutus also wrote Robben Island sequence. Robben Island was where they kept the political prisoners like Mandela and the, the other leaders of the ANC. And he expresses the same feelings of muted outrage. I quote briefly, some mornings we line up for a hospital it meant mostly getting castor oil, castor oil for split heads, smashed ankles, arms, cut feet, or torn and bloodied legs. Castor oil should treat that. Likewise, Mazizi Kunene, who wrote the poem called The Gold Miners, mutedly protests against the natives' exclusion from the bountiful resources of their homeland. He writes, towers rise to the skies, sounds echo their music, bells ring backwards and forwards, awakening the crowds from the center of the fire. Attendance at the feast, glitter, wealth piles on the mountains, but we stand by watching parades, walking the deserted halls, we who are locked out and locked in the pits of gold. However, when you look back at the closing stanza of Benedict Lecazis in the gold mines, we see the beginnings of the militant protest poetry of the younger generation. And I quote briefly, be careful, though I go unarmed today, there was a time when from these worn out arms, long bladed spears were flung far and wide. It's a little uh, shortened, but the entire poem goes uh, deeper than that. It has been said that when uh, civilization, here uh, replace civilization with uh, apartheid, is moribund, it's on its death legs, its values are ridiculed. And so it was with the third phase of black South African poetry. No longer merely content with uh, bewailing the condition of the people, the post Soweto poets now sought to reawaken their spirit and consciousness of self through mockery of the laws of apartheid and the regulations that kept them in place. And also with uh, oblique allusions to arms as a means of uh, change. Oswald Mitchali wrote the following. It's called Pigeons at the Oppenheimer Park. An excellent example, I believe, of the satirical poem. I wonder why these pigeons in the Oppenheimer Park are never arrested and prosecuted for trespassing on private property and charged with public indecency. 
Every day I see these insolent birds perched on whites only benches, defying all authority. Don't they know of the Separate Amenities Act? A white policeman in full uniform, complete with a holstered 38 special, passes without even raising a reprimanding finger at the offenders who are flouting the law. They not only sit on the hallowed benches, they also mess them up with bird shit. Oh, holy ideology. Look at those two at the crest of the jumping impala. They are making love in full view of madams, hobos, giggling office girls. What is this world coming to? Where is the sacred immorality act? Jesus. Likewise, Sifo Sipamla, to whom it may concern rights, bearer, bear of everything but particulars is a bantu. Bearer's designation is reference number 417181. And he's, he acquires a niche in the said area as a temporary sojourner to which he must betake himself at all times when his services are dispensed with for the day as a permanent measure of the law and order. Less satirical, but more, much more militant, is Michali's ride upon the death chariot, based upon a true story, a true incident. They rode upon the death chariot to their Golgotha, three vagrants whose papers to be in Caesar's empire were not in order. The sun shriveled their bodies in the mobile tomb as airtight as canned fish. We are hot, we are thirsty, we are hungry. The centurion tugged their tongues with the tip of a lance dipped in apathy. Now, as I said, this was based on a true story in which uh, a paddy wagon taking a, you know, accused, the accused, uh, I guess, uh, natives from Johannesburg to Pretoria broke down, and the wardens sealed up the vehicle with their black cargo inside and set out to seek help. The day was scorching hot. The prisoners, of course, suffocated. No charges were brought because nobody cared. After this, even the usually mild-toned Dennis Brutus began to wax militant. Witnesses poem called At a Funeral. Arise, the brassy shout of freedom stirs our earth. Not death, but death's head tyranny sights our ground and plus our narrow cells of pain, defeat, and dearth. Better that we should die than that we should lie down. You get echoes of Claude McKay in this one. James Matthews, the night, or it is night, declares that the night of apartheid will seed to the dawn of freedom and justice. And like Matthews's poem, A.C. Jordans, you tell me to sit quiet in sights to action. At this point, the militant protest poems do not uh, mince words to say. The most overtly and stridently militant of the post-Soweto poets is Don Matera, born in 1935 and still uh, kicking, as I say, who, along with Oswald Michali and Mogani Sarote, actively participated in the student uprising of Soweto. Soweto is a short form of the Southwest Territories. Matera's poem, called The Heat of Chains, offers no illusions of a peaceful resolution to the South African problem. Likewise, his poem, called No Time, Black Man, from which I quote, does the same. Stand, black man, and put that cap back on your beaten head. Look him in the eye, cold and blue like the devil's fire, and tell him enough. Three centuries is more than enough. What I hope you will uh, draw from this brief panoramic trace, tracing of the evolution of black South African poetry from its epical face of pride and self through its uh, plaintive, elegiacal face during apartheid, and ultimately to the militant face of the mid-1970s and late 1980s, with all its defiance and uh, fulminations against apartheid, is that black South African poetry, not unlike their American, uh, African-American brothers in the struggle for civil rights, was very instrumental 
in the eventual dismantling of apartheid, which came to an end in 1991, as were their compatriots in military fatigues on the battlefield and the economic sanctions. In other words, what I'm saying is, South Africa's ultimate conversion from apartheid to democracy must be credited to the vice and clamp of economic sanctions, we can't deny that, to the Kalashnikov and Molotov cocktail of the ANC's freedom fighters in the field, and especially to the poet's pen. And as much as it was the poets that awakened the conscience of the world through their writings and the self-consciousness of the South African natives themselves to act in concert to kill apartheid. So now, when in response to the question who killed apartheid, and the poet cries, nay, it was I, I think, instead of silence, we should cheer and clap and not sniggle. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Apwa. Absolutely. Our next speaker is Arnold E. Brown. Arnold spent his entire life advocating change on, and making a difference in and outside of Bergen County. From integrating public schools in Englewood to passing legislation that improved the lives of our citizens, uh, he has been a pioneer and a leader. <clears throat> Mr. Brown is a lifelong community activist, noted Bergen County historian, and first African American assembly, uh, assemblyman from Bergen County. In addition to being president of his own business consulting firm, he is the president of the Du Bois Book Center, an e-commerce business specializing in rare and out-of-print books, uh, new and used by and about African Americans. Please welcome Mr. Arnold E. Brown. Good afternoon. It's good to be here. Let me tell you a little bit about myself before I get started, and I will try and keep my remarks very brief. I'm a lifelong resident of Bergen County. Uh, actually, my father's side of the family have resided in Bergen County before the American, Civil, uh, the American Revolutionary War. So I have deep roots in New Jersey, and I have a lot of sensitivity to the issues that uh, come against our community. Now this year, we are celebrating two great moments in civil rights history. 150 years from the Emancipation Proclamation signed by President Abraham Lincoln 150 years ago, and also the 50th anniversary of the Great March on Washington. Now, a lot of moments in civil rights history, because of my age now, um, I was in college, I was graduating from Bowling Green State University in 1954. And what great event occurred in 1954 but the U United States Supreme Court decision of Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, ruling out discrimination in education. <coughs> so that touched me. As we moved along to the next year, a young man from Chicago, Emmett Till, was swept off the street, killed, and threw into the river, the Tallahassee River in Mississippi. That's one year after I graduated. Was well, that same year you heard Mrs. Lacey say that Rosa Parks, what did she do? She would not move her seat or give it up. All protesting injustice here in this country. As you know, as President Lyndon Bain Johnson says, the issue of civil rights is not a southern issue, is not a northern issue, is not an eastern issue, is not a western issue, it's not a black issue, it's not a religious issue, it's an American issue. It affects all of us. And that brings home a very poignant message to me. Now in 1963, I've, I've been involved in uh, community relations and in civil rights. In 1962, I was at the White House. 
at a conference of community leaders. I got an invitation to go to the March on Washington. And by the way, the pictures you see here were taken by me as I was at the March on Washington. As I sat no more than 15 feet from Dr. King when he gave that infamous speech, I have a dream. Now that, that speech stirred into me even more concern about community issues, about things that are right and the things that are wrong, and gave me a determination to go back home, go back home and do more than I had been. Because I had previously been involved in the Urban League movement, in the NAACP movement, and uh, local community issues. Uh, I got the nerve to run for the state legislature three times. Or run only, I only won once, though. And I was elected a, uh, an assemblyman from Bergen County. But that I have a dream speech from Dr. King moved me so that I continue to work in the community. In 1966, uh, President Johnson invited me to a uh, conference at the White House of community leaders. Uh, he called that conference the White House Conference to fulfill these rights. And people often say, now, Kennedy wanted to do right. Kennedy was in the position and the moral position to move forward on civil rights. He had some questions about the March on Washington. Uh, but after the March on Washington, where you got 200,000 people, people from every walk of life here in, in, in America. Uh, converging on the Lincoln Memorial and making a statement. No, and remind you, 250,000 people and no incident of disruption, no fighting, nothing of the kind, a peaceful demonstration to show America that we are concerned about the issues that face minorities. Well, Kennedy had the determination and he was moving forward. After the march, he had called the leaders in to discuss uh, what should be done. They had, he had already placed a bill in the Congress, uh, a civil rights bill. Uh, he thought that was going to stop the people from marching on Washington, but it didn't. It only encouraged them to do more. And after the march, when he called the leaders in, he made his commitment to follow through on his civil rights bill. Unfortunately, we know on, the, on November 22nd, the same year, 1963, uh, he was assassinated. And Lyndon Baines Johnson, a man from Texas now, from the South, who assumed the presidency and took the oath, he was the one that moved the Civil Rights Bill of 1965. He moved that bill. He made it happen. And he went around the country giving various speeches. and. Um, one of his speeches was given at the Howard University where he received the Doctors of Law degree uh, from Howard University. And his remarks were to fulfill these rights because he was firmly committed. So I'm involved, I'm in my community, and an opportunity arises for me to participate in building a monument, a statue of Dr. Martin Luther King. Seven-foot statue, you can see uh, that's the model of it, what it's going to look like. It's bronze. Uh, it's going to stand on the Hackensack River pathway as it crosses Fairleigh Dickinson University's campus. But to me, the, the 20th century, the greatest 20th century philosopher and moralist is Dr. King, because he gives a message. And I thought the erection of this statue would give a message to generation after generation those who are coming through, not only the community at large, but on a, on a uh, college campus, an opportunity to rethink the moral issues and the principles uh, that Dr. King uh, fought for. So I'm just happy to be here, happy to share these few moments with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Our fourth speaker, our last speaker, is Mr. Sean Aiken, who is a 2007 graduate of CCM uh, with an associate degree in journalism. Uh, during his time at the college, he became heavily involved in extracurricular activities, among them student government, Phi Theta Kappa International Honor Society, and the Black Student Union. 
Perhaps his greatest contribution to the college were made via his time with the school paper, the Youngtown Edition, first as a contributor, then as a staff writer, and eventually as editor-in-chief. After completing an internship at the Daily Record, Sean went to the University of Pennsylvania, graduating in 2011 with a bachelor's degree in communication from the infamous Annenberg School. Mr. Aiken currently works as a freelance journalist and spends the bulk of his time writing for and promoting his own blog, Shaken. Please welcome Mr. Sean Aiken. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Professor Kalis. Uh, it's very good to see some of the professors. I saw Dr. Perella here, Dr. Eber, Dean Caffey, and some of my friends. And great to see all you guys, all the students. Everybody looks enthused. I'll try to keep this short. Oftentimes, when we think about civil rights, we place it within the context of the civil rights movement. And we know the civil rights movement was roughly in the mid-1950s to the late 1960s. And we know some of the major players. We know Dr. Martin Luther King was the major player. And we talk about the I Have a Dream speech. And we talk about the violence and the turbulence of the era. And we oftentimes assign to the civil rights movement completion and progress. And we oftentimes say it was largely a success. And we recall the era, and we kind of, as an aside, say there's much work to be done. But we usually consider the civil rights movement a success. Now, 50 years later, civil rights is still on the public agenda. But the face has changed a bit. You know, civil rights now is more encompassing. It's now almost as much about gay rights and women's rights and veterans' rights and illegal immigrants' rights as much as it is about African-American rights. And that's all well and good that's actually to be expected, you know. Um, civil rights are for everybody. What I do want to suggest that to the African American students, you know, stay very vigilant and very active for your own causes. And your own causes are going to be the causes that affect you most. That would be employment, and the disproportionate income gap, the disproportionate uh, incarceration between blacks and other races, disproportionate levels of um, educational opportunity, educational apartheid, if you will, uh, disproportionate access to quality health care. So I would expect that many, if not all of you, would be very active in supporting worthy causes. And for example, women's rights. You know, uh, Republican lawmakers have had some nasty things to say about women in regard to abortion and in regard to rape. And um, we know states like Texas and Arizona have detained and deported thousands of illegal immigrants. And we know that gays have been persecuted often. Uh, for example, um, there's some proposed legislation, and uh, the Employment Non-Discrimination Act is aimed at protecting gays and uh, transgenders from discrimination in the workforce. So there are certainly issues and certainly groups that need attention and they need help to have attention brought to their issues. And it is very, it's a worthwhile thing for us as African Americans and as people to be supportive of these other causes. Just make sure you don't forget your own causes, you know. 
make yourself respected. You can do more worth. You can do more worth good when you come from an organization that is active and effective for your own cause. You can be a better help for women, for feminist issues. You can be a greater help to veterans issues. If you're coming from a place that is active and effective and is being taken very seriously for your own issues. Um, Professor Apwa said earlier today that uh, when he was talking that apartheid wasn't really the system that oppressed black people in America. And it might not, not, it might not have been called apartheid, but I do believe apartheid has been the system of oppression for African Americans from the 50s and the original civil rights era up until now. I, I still think we're experiencing apartheid in the areas I name, most notably in the workforce and with the income gap, in education, in access to quality health care and medical, and definitely with uh, incarceration rates and the way by which we are profiled and seen by law enforcement officials. Um, I also want to say I believe education is a great equalizer. You know, uh, before I came to CCM, I had come from a very long, hard road in my life. You know, and uh, I got here and. I was telling Mr. Brown here about how when I got here, I signed up for the journalism program. And there was, there was actually no more seats in the, my journalism class, the first one I signed up for, you know. And the, the esteemed Dr. Noel Robinson was my professor. And I remember begging her to get in the class. There was no more seats. And I said, please, Dr. Robinson, I'll be your best student, you know. And so she stopped. Now, mind you, when I heard the name Noelle Robinson, I thought she was a black lady, <laughs> for whatever reason. You know? I said, well, the class is full, but this black lady's going to see me, and man, she's going to throw me right in there. And I got there, and I saw a woman who more resembled a grade school teacher in 1920, and she just commanded respect on sight from me, you know? So I'm telling her, you know, please let me in, Dr. Robinson. I'll be your best student. She stopped and she looked at me and she said, okay, as if to say, we'll see, you know? And uh, that, was really the, that was really the start of something wonderful for me. Once I got in the class, I did everything I could do for the entire time I was in the journalism program to show her that she made a great decision by letting me in. And uh, I actually had a bitter edge on me about some things before I got here. And CCM was just the most pleasant place for me, you know. I, I was able to come here and get away from so many issues that I had on my mind, you know. Being a issues that I feel like in some way had to do with me being a black male. You know, some of the struggles in my life uh, I brought on myself. Um, you know, I've, uh, I've been incarcerated. You know, I've been, uh, I graduated high school in 1987. I went to college, I dropped out. I spent many years wandering, doing things that I knew better than, but I was just lacking in direction, and something made me come to CCM and decide to get things in order. And every professor here, everyone I ever came into contact with here was not just willing to help, but excited to help me get to where I was trying to go. So this is what I'm telling the African American students and all the students here, you know, if you're really intent on getting somewhere, from this college, these professors 
even the other students here, they'll help you. And I consider education a great equalizer because we're better able to combat the mechanisms against you if you're educated and when you're dealing with other educated people. And without education, you're almost food for the system. Oftentimes, you are food for the system if you're a black man, if you're a black male in particular. So, jeez, oh, I had a lot to say when I came up here and it kind of all just vanished out of my head. But I wanna say I'm very thankful for this opportunity to be able to speak and I definitely would hope that all the African American students would take the opportunity that you have here at CCM to make your voice heard, you know, make your voice count, and consider that education will be an equalizer in your life. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Aiken. I uh, would like to enter into a panel discussion right now, and I have a few questions that I would like to ask, and I will start out with one, but I think in the interest of time, uh, I will move to, uh, after, my, after the first question, I think I'll move to the audience, and if the audience doesn't have questions, I'll continue, but I think it would be <laughs> beneficial to hear uh, what, what you have to ask. But uh, um, one thing that I, I really uh, would like to know is, uh, you know, especially those of you who have actually heard the words of Martin Luther King in 1963, uh, particularly if you were there, uh, did you at the time understand that history was in the making? I mean, at that time, did you know that the historical significance that was taking place that day? And could you describe your emotions? Well, to respond, uh, no, you don't know it's a historic moment. You're living your life, you're participating, you're doing uh, the activity that you, uh, you like. And you understand, though, that as his I have a dream phrases reach the crowd, at first there was nothing going on. They accepted his speech. And, but as they, that phrase kept coming on, the crowd just erupted. And, uh, uh, and approval. You, and you knew it was special, but from a historic point of view, no. No. Mm -hmm. As uh, I indicated to you, I got to know Dr. King before he became to national prominence. And so he was just a wonderful person to know. I remember a night that we gave him a surprise birthday party. And he was just totally elated, just as any of us would be. Not the person that we know now who has given the world so much. So I agree with Dr. Brown. We thought he was a, a really a fine person. On Sunday mornings to hear him uh, give his sermons, you would leave and have lots to feed on for the week, but never dream that he was become as large and is effective and have such an impact on the world that he had. Thank you. Thank you. So before I go on with some of the questions I have, I think maybe I would like to turn it over to the audience uh, and see if there are any questions for our panelists. Yes. Okay, uh, my question for the guest speakers. Um, what do you think about the phrase that was popularized several years ago? Can you speak up, please? Since Obama, what do you think about the phrase that was popularized several years ago since Obama's election that we are living in a post-racial society? Please. Please. Uh, <laughs> chime in as need be. Uh, I would challenge that assertion. I would say we are absolutely not living in a post-racial society because we recognize race immediately is probably the first thing that comes on to any of our minds um, almost every day, depending on our situation. Uh, I believe we are living in a society that has in some ways gotten past race, but there are, there's still a long way to go before we can 
legitimately claim that we live in a post-racial society. As a matter of fact, we won't be living in a post-racial society anytime soon. That's just my opinion. I think if, if you would ask uh, President Obama that question today, he'd have a good answer for you because we are living in a racial society. But I think what he was trying to do is lift the country up to move us forward so that we would not be in a racial society. And I think that's really what he was trying to do for us. The signs. Have a, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to add a, a little more to that by going back to what, what Miss Lacey had said earlier about the bird that flies forwards while, while it's looking backwards. I'm uh, proud to say that bird is a Ghanaian bird. <laughs> it's, called the San, it's called the Sankofa bird. And it simply does that because it says you have to know where you came from to know where you're going. You cannot forget the past. So uh, Obama's efforts at uh, making this uh, raceless society is, of course, a work in progress. So I cannot say that it is over. You just have to be aware. And uh, just something a little on the, perhaps not directly related, I'm in trying to encourage my students and the students here at large to stay alert, as Sean was saying, about what is going on around us. I just came from a class in which uh, we we're talking about uh, making choices. And I asked the class if they knew somebody called Private Manning or somebody called Snowden. And out of 20 students, not a single one knew anything. And I was disappointed because I just thought somebody should know, the young people should know, because you are what we're looking forward to. Okay? You are the future. And I think basically you should be aware of it. I'm not asking you to make any political choices, but just be aware of things going on locally and internationally, because that was, that's what makes you a citizen of the world. Yes, I just wanted to add that the signs are down. There are no longer signs over the water fountain, on the buses, at the theaters, and places where you cannot sit, eat, and, and be part of. But the intents are still there, so that you won't see what you we have talked about in history in terms of the way it looked. But you must be careful to be observant that the intent is the same. And the same, uh, even though the, the signs are not up, there are subtle ways that people are discriminated against. It won't be what you have heard of in the past, but you have to be careful to know when people are being discriminated against, and you must stand up and speak out about it. Another question? Yes. Do you feel as if this generation um, is upholding the standards of what Dr. Hume talked about in his speech? I didn't get the last. Uh, could you repeat it? This generation. Uh, do you believe that Dr. King, uh, or that this generation is upholding the standards set by Dr. King? Yes. I have concern that in our schools, we have not really been taught our history. And so that many young people really don't know the history. You may recently uh, seen articles in the paper concerning the N-word the most recent insult with the football player in that whole scenario. You know, if you really don't know the meaning and the background, it, things don't have the same uh, impact upon you. So that I think we've done an injustice to our young people in not providing them with the kind of historical data that they need to feed on so that they can recognize I'm guilty, I must tell you, I have four children, and I did try to shield them of many of the abuses that I en encountered. But I did tell them the stories. They do know the stories. They, they will be able to recognize when they see discrimination. 
but you know, it's painful. And you don't want uh, each generation to have to suffer the, the, the past. But you need to be alert because it rears, it's segregation, discrimination, rear their ugly heads in many different ways. Yes. yes. I have a question for you. Um, as, as you experienced person uh, and witnessed the start of the revolution, um, do you think the process is completed now? And what else do we start doing in addition to what has done before? As you know, maybe 10 or 20 years ago, white people were not allowed, were not able to walk in Harlem anymore. Now they can. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big change. Yes. Um, I just want to address the white people couldn't walk in Harlem 10 or 20 years ago. I'm 45 years old, and I'm probably, probably I'm sure I'm the, I'm the youngest of the panelists, but I'm probably older than a lot of you guys, and there hasn't been many places in America over the last 20 years that white people couldn't walk. This is America. And, you know, if there are places that white people couldn't walk in America, then black people would probably have a hard time walking in those places too. So you walking in Harlem and me walking in Harlem probably wouldn't be that big a difference because we, we would both stick out like a sore thumb. <laughs> Yes, the gentleman in the front row. Uh, my, my question was, history teaches that the Mason-Dixon line starts, I guess, Virginia somewhere. What, what do you say since you got experiences? You say it starts out in There were uh, two surveys, and I can't recall the name. The Mason-Dixon line running between uh, Cincinnati in on uh, that side of the country, in Washington, D.C., and Virginia on the other. I experienced that many times, taking the train from Montgomery, Alabama, to New York City. I would have to sit in a section on the train that was just behind the coal bin, and the trains used to run on coal. And of course, there was not uh, air condition, so the soot from the train, from the coal bins would, of course, fly into the, that section. You would have to sit there until you reach Washington, D.C., uh, which was uh, part of the Mason-Dixon line, and then you could get on a different kind of train. And the same thing was true if you were going out Ohio uh, in the West. So it was real uh, in that sense. Yes. Thank you very much for coming tonight. One question is nearly years has spanned since the passing of the Civil Rights Law in 1965. For each of you, I pose the question what is the single most area of that law that you have not seen press forward in 50 years? And what you propose for us to do in taking action to see? Some you mentioned, uh, well, yeah. employment. I would say with varying amounts of equality, all of those things, education, employment, and uh, the disparity in incarceration rates. So I would think those three things in particular have been kind of overlooked and swept under the rug and kind of forgotten about since the Civil Rights Act of 1964, I believe it was. The single greatest achievement has been voting rights. You can say that. Um, that has pretty well been addressed. Uh, the other issues that the bill addresses we are still dealing with today and still affects the community economically, housing, you name it. Still a problem. Well, in my personal case, I think uh, there's been improvement in the housing uh, sector because I tell a personal story. When I uh, first was employed here, I lived in uh, Orange, and it was quite a, 
a drive, especially with the gas uh, or oil embargo. We we're allowed only four gallons every other day, and I had that, I guess, big monster of a car <laughs> that uh, stuck to everything. You know. I tried to get an apartment here nearby the school, and I looked in the paper, I saw ads, I called, they said, oh, come on down, we got them. As soon as I got there, the guy said, oh, we just rented all of them. Bes besides, we have our quota, his words. And of course, I was just shocked. I was kind of naive coming from where I came from. There was no such uh, behavior. And I mentioned it to a, a class I was teaching and how upset I was. And one of the ladies in the class raised her hand and said, do you remember his name? And I said, yes. And she turned red, took her books and walked out and said, that bastard. It was her husband. Oh. And, and she said, do you really want to live there? I said, I would. She said, all right, I'll bring you the form tomorrow. <laughs> she, brought me a, she brought me a form. I filled it, gave it back to her. She came back the next day and said, he wants to talk to you. And I called him and said, well, when do you want to move in? <laughs> so I don't think, well, good thing, but uh, I didn't need to have to go through a middle person to get what I knew I could afford. So, but I think these things have improved now. So. <laughs> My greatest concern is public education. We spent a great deal of time uh, in trying to improve public education. And with the uh, coming of integration of schools, I think we thought that we had uh, achieved that goal. Now, if you look across the country, public schools are almost all segregated again. So that, you know, it's not that one has to necessarily sit in a seat next to someone. But it's the opportunity to be able to sit with other people who are different that you can learn from and that you can then go out into the workforce and work with. Public education really is our foundation of our country in terms of making certain that we all have an opportunity to learn. If we allow that to deteriorate, uh, I am not opposed to religious schools or private schools or charters of that sort. But I think we have lost our focus on the importance of educating our masses through public education. When <clears throat> When you arrived today, uh, hopefully you were listening to some music, and uh, the music was selected specifically from the era, and the, and the specific songs all had to deal with the civil rights movement. Uh, so I have a question about music and the arts in terms of civil rights, and that is, is there anything similar today that matches the kind of artistic expression that took place during that time? Is there anything going on today in order to help the movement? No. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'll invite everybody to come argue with you afterwards. <laughs> I would like to thank all of the speakers here. Mrs. Lacey, <laughs> Professor Apwa, <laughs> Mr. Brown, Mr. Sh Mr. Aiken, and Mr. Aiken, Mr. Shaken, uh, for coming here today. Thank you very much. On behalf of the communication department, uh, and uh, Professor John Soltis, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you.